Okay. Hello and welcome, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Ola Benny, and I work as a developer for ThoughtWorks. If, if you've been in the architecture track, you have probably already seen two of my colleagues go before me, both Neil Ford and Sam Newman. Uh, and they've been talking about a lot about architecture from the perspective of what you should do and what you shouldn't do and, and things like that. Uh, this talk is a little bit different. Uh, this talk is about a project that I led. Uh, I spent the whole of 2012 working on a quite interesting project, and um, I'm basically going to tell you about it, uh, a little bit about, about what makes it interesting, but also uh, a little bit of the architecture that we used in order to even make it possible. So um, before I begin, uh, I've been told to remind all of you about the app and that you should vote in the app. Um, so now that I've done that, we can start with this. So I'm a developer. I've done a lot of different types of development through the years. Um, I'm a programming language geek, among other things. Um, but my work at ThoughtWorks has allowed me to do a lot of different things. Uh, in the beginning of 2012, I was tasked with being the tech lead for a project for a company called Anai Systems. And we came in, and we didn't really have any idea about the domain. And they didn't really have any idea about the how they were going to solve the problem. They knew what space they wanted to do the solution and what kind of constraints they had in order to, to get to a solution. Uh, but they didn't really know what the solution looked like. So uh, I'm going to, the, the first, the first uh, five minutes or so, I'm going to give you a very quick introduction to the pertinent details of the domain and what's actually relevant for solving the problem from our perspective. Um, and then uh, we're going to go into how we actually ended up solving the problem. Uh, I might use the words E2 or Fred. Uh, both of them are, are the words for, for the solution we ended up with. Um, it doesn't really matter what they mean, because they're both backronyms. Um, if you have any questions as we go along, um, you have the app. And if there is time at the end, which I hope it will be, um, I'll be able to answer questions then. If you have something that is very unclear or anything like that, just, just raise your hand and ask as we go along. Uh, some of this stuff is a little bit complicated. and. I know because I, I didn't know anything about molecular biology before I, I did this project, so I had to pick it up as we, uh, as we went along. Is there anyone here who knows molecular biology? OK, fantastic. So uh, when I simplify, no one is going to notice. OK, so the problem, um, if, I, if, I, if I should uh, simplify the problem statement in one word, uh, it's to solve cancer. Um, a little bit more context to solve cancer based on the current technical advancements made in sequencing uh, and to, uh, to kind of expand a little bit more on that. To, to solve doesn't really mean to solve, but to give better tra treatment options than are available right now. So before we get into cancer itself, uh, it's, it's useful to be sure about some terms. So DNA is something we all have heard of, I think. I'm not even going to bore you with the, what it actually stands for. But it's a string of bases. Uh, and these bases are uh, usually organized in a long, long, long string that is usually seen as a double helix. Uh, you've all seen the pictures. So what is a base or a nuclear base? A nuclear base is one of four different molecules. These molecules are usually called A, C, G, and T. And in the helix format, most of the time, these will complement each other. So on one side, you will have a C. Then on the other side, you will have a G. Or on one side, you will have a T. Or you, and then you will have an A on the other side. So you have two strings that are wound around each other. And no, no matter which side you read from, you will get the same information, although complementary to each other. RNA is what you take DNA and out of it comes RNA. So RNA is free-floating particles that float around inside of your cell. It's very similar to DNA, um, but it's used for communicating and, and doing a lot of other things inside of a cell. You will see sometimes a U instead of a T when talking about RNA. But it's really the same kind of molecules we're talking about. And then finally, RNA gets translated into proteins. And a protein can also be named polypeptides. Uh, and a protein is composed of a string of amino acids. And there are 20 amino acids that are the, the common ones that we use. Uh, proteins 
are the things that actually do stuff inside of your body. They're, they can be enzymes or they can be all kinds of other things. And the proteins are also the pieces of the body that actually uh, is in charge of the process of turning DNA into RNA and turning RNA into proteins and so on. So it's a recursive process. In order to translate DNA to proteins, you need to understand um, that, so since we only have four letters in the DNA uh, alphabet, uh, we need a way of encoding them so, so that we get 20 different amino acids. And this is done by using codons. One codon is a set of three different bases, uh, and that gets translated into an amino acid. Uh, so we have a 64, uh, 64 different um, possibilities, and that actually means that our code in the, the DNA code is highly redundant, so any single amino acid has several different codings for it. And then finally, what is a gene? We talk about, uh, the word gene is used very unspecifically. Most of the time, a gene is really just some piece of DNA get, that gets translated into uh, a protein. But the real proper definition is a little bit wider than that. It says that a gene is an inherited unit under selection. And all of these words are really, really important. So inherited means that you get it from your parents. A unit is the smallest possible thing that if you don't take it apart, if you take it apart, it will not have any meaning anymore. And under selection means that uh, the benefit to the organism is going to be reduced if you take it away in one way or another. Variants. Uh, if you hear me say variant, you can, you can mentally substitute mutation. Uh, they are not actually the same, but for, for our purposes, it doesn't really matter. Uh, if you read the literature, uh, you will find no genetic papers or no molecular biology papers that, that use the word mutation. I, instead, it's called variants. Now, there are two types of variants. Uh, germline variants and somatic variants. Germline variants are the ones that you get from your parents. They are uh, the, the mutations that make you different from each other. Somatic variants are the ones that you have when you have a disease that causes uh, genomic differences. So if you have a tumor, you're going to have somatic variants that are different in that part of the body compared to the rest of the body. Uh, a typical human uh, has about three billion base pairs in our DNA. So that, that's the full recipe for a human, three billion base pairs. Uh, what makes you different from any other human in this audience or anywhere else is roughly on the order of five million germline mutations. So that's what makes us different. So that's DNA and genomics. Uh, so I mentioned in the beginning that the reason why this project was timely was because of the rapid increases in sequencing. Now, what is sequencing? Well, it's taking physical pieces of DNA, actual uh, cl uh, clumps of DNA, and turning that into bits, turning that into strings that we can use in a computer figuring out what the code is for a specific person at a specific place. And this is an interesting process that um, basically you have to do a lot of different things. You have to prepare the physical sample, then you chop it up into really, really small segments. Once you've done that, you take each one of the segments and you uh, do a, a physical process on each piece of it in order to figure out what base is there. And then you have to put it together again because these pieces come in in a jumbled order, so you have no idea where they came from. And there are two pieces that is uh, called assembly and alignment. And this is why, up until very recently, you needed supercomputers in order to do this part of, of sequencing. So it was extremely expensive. Even now, the, the, the big labs doing this stuff, it takes several days for them to do the alignment. Because alignment is taking each one of those 200 base pairs. Remember, we have 3 billion base pairs in our whole body. And you shop that up randomly into 200 base pair long things. Alignment is really taking each one of them and doing a fussy string search against the reference that we have, figuring out where it should be. But out of it, we get a long sequence that hopefully matches more or less what the, uh, what the DNA for a specific individual is. Optional here is to do something called variant calling, where you compare something against something else. It's basically a diff. You compare two genomes and out you get what the uh, differences are, what the variants are. Now, the first sequencing of a human being was done uh, through the Hugo project, and the cost for that was in the range of several million dollars, and it took several years uh, to do it. It was extremely expensive, extremely labor-intensive. 
Since then, uh, the price uh, and the time necessary to do a sequencing for a person has dropped rapidly. And we are now very, very close to the point where you can get your genome sequenced for $1,000. And the $1,000 genome is what people have been talking about as this magic limit. Once we get to that place, then we can do everything we want to do with genome sequencing. Of course, there is nothing really sp uh, specific about the number, uh, uh, number $1,000, but that's what people have been talking about. And when we started this project, the price was down to maybe 10000 and we could see the writing on the wall. We knew that the cost was going to go down further and further. And very soon, you're going to be in a situation where actually, every time you go to a doctor, my vision is that you, you, take, you, <laughs> you open the door, you take the handle, and uh, the sequencing starts when you, uh, it just snaps up your DNA from your hand, and when you sit down, the doctor will have the results on his screen. We're not exactly there yet, but we're very close to the point where for any serious, um, for any serious uh, problem you have, uh, you will get a sequence done just uh, as a part of the treatment or a part of the diagnosis. However, at this point, Genomic uh, information has not been really part of the, uh, um, well, it's been a lot of research, but it's not a part of the clinical world. So what we wanted to uh, do was to take uh, these advances and apply them in the clinical world and actually give better benefits back to people. So that brings us to cancer. Cancer is not a disease. It's really a class of diseases. It's 10,000 different diseases. Uh, because cancer is really, um, a broad classification of something that can go wrong uh, to cause your cells to multiply without control. And there are many ways that this can go wrong. In fact, there are tens of thousands of ways that the uh, genomic machinery can go wrong to make this happen. So um, we, uh, we also classify cancer based on where it happens. Uh, if you get breast cancer, it's very different from getting uh, a skin cancer, for example. Well. In reality, the genomic mutations are actually very similar to each other in many cases, so they don't have to be different. So these modifications of DNA that can happen, there are lots of them. Uh, for example, you can, pro um, you can have a mutation that stops cells from killing themselves, which they will do if something goes wrong. But if you have a mutation that stops that, then uh, you get a cancer. Or you can have something that enhances the growth cycle to make, uh, to make the cells multiply much, much faster than they should otherwise. Or you can have uh, something that removes one of the error correction mechanisms. I don't know if it made any news here in, uh, in Denmark when um, um, the name is escaping me. Uh, th there was a famous actress a few months ago who decided to have her breasts removed. And, oh, thank you, yes. Angelina Jolie. And the reason why she did this was because she discovered that she had a very uh, a, a mutation in a gene, a gene called BRCA1. BRCA1 is an error correction mechanism. The only reason why you have that protein in your body is to stop your body from developing breast cancer. Uh, and there is a lot of different pieces of machinery inside of the body that just exist to stop these things from happening. But if uh, a mutation happens in one of them, then you have a much higher risk of, of getting one of these uh, cancers, and then uh, you mo most likely will. So these genetic modifications are really what makes cancer happen. Uh, however, once a cancer mutation has happened, a lot of other mutations usually crop up really quickly because a lot of the pieces uh, of, of DNA that is in charge of guarding against that basically disappears when the cancer starts multiplying. So that, that means that you get something called, so the driver mutations uh, are really the ones that cause the cancer, while the passenger mutations are just along for the ride. They don't really matter. So that means that it's very, very noisy environment to figure out why a cancer happened uh, from a genomic standpoint. Now, a typical cancer, when we, when we notice it, uh, a typical cancer will have about 10,000 different mutations. 10,000 doesn't sound like a lot, but actually it's very complicated to figure out which ones of them are relevant and which ones are not. So that brings me to the final part of the, the reason why we did this project, and that's the treatment problem. And the treatment problem is really that if you get cancer today and you go to a doctor, uh, the standard of care is based on the organ you get that cancer. So if you get ovarian cancer uh, and you go to a doctor, uh, ovarian cancer happens to be very deadly, by the way. It's, it's one of those cancers that if you, if you 
are alive within a year, uh, or if you're alive a year from the point you get it, you're in the lucky 5% or something along those lines. So it's almost a death sentence uh, to, to get ovarian cancer in terms of time. Now, if you go to a doctor with, and they find that you have ovarian cancer, there are three different uh, chemotherapies that you can be prescribed. Each one of those work a little bit different from each other. And uh, which one you will get, uh, there is really no way for the doctor to make a um, good choice there. So what typically happens is that the doctor flips a coin, or he uses something that's worked before, or he used something that his hospital prescribes, or he uses something that the insurance company thinks should be used. But the important point is he has no real basis for making the choice between one of these three chemos. So if it doesn't work, try the next one until you find something that works. Now, of course, chemotherapy is extremely painful. Um, they're expensive, $100,000 for a round, and three months of time, and extreme suffering for the patient, and, and pain and damage. So, in this situation, it's very important to make the right choice first. If you, if you get ovarian cancer, for example, three months of time is actually, uh, can be the difference between life and death. Uh, and uh, so uh, making the right choice first is really, really important. Now, the information is out there. There is a lot of research papers that have done a lot of research on which chemos work on which uh, genetic markers. But co connecting that up with what mutations a specific individual actually has has not been done so far. But research papers and clinical trial data has this information. So, so this is really the problem statement. This is um, the information. After we'd learned enough molecular biology to understand what all this stuff meant, uh, this is a synthesis or a, a summary of the um, information we had when we, maybe two months, three months in, started to actually solving the problem instead of uh, exploring the solution space. Um, I'm just going to mention a few things uh, quickly about us, because I say us all the time. Um, we were working for this startup, Anai Systems. They provided us with a few first-class molecular biologists that could teach us what we were doing. Uh, the team was four people from ThoughtWorks. Um, it was not a standard team in any way. Uh, we were all developers. We ended up all being domain experts. We ended up all being... Uh, QAs, we all ended up being business analysts, uh, we all ended up doing a lot of XD, and we all ended up doing DevOps. So this is a team that we were four people that basically did everything that had to be done on this project from, from beginning to end. And uh, a big part of the first few weeks was just understanding the domain enough to, to get to a point where we could um, uh, decide what to do. And, and that brings me to the process side. Uh, I would say we, we did things in a very agile way, but it was not capital A agile. This was a uh, heavily changed process to work under our constraints and work with the kind of problem statement we were doing. We were not really solving a problem. We were, uh, well, or rather, we were not really implementing a solution. We were actually trying to pro solve the problem and figure that out. So the first, the first thing we did was to put up our infrastructure so on day two, we had a full uh, continuous delivery infrastructure so we could uh, deploy over and over again until, uh, all the new things that we came up with. And then we started building a backend that kind of implemented a lot of the, uh, the understanding of molecular biology we got. And at the same time, we started building front ends that we tested out on uh, some of our... Um, some of our clients or uh, client people. So fundamentally, the first three weeks, I think we built maybe 16 or 20 different user interfaces to explore different aspects of the, of the data we were dealing with. And then uh, on the back end, at the same time, we were uh, coming to grips on what the problem actually was and, and what could provide value uh, for our end users. Uh, and we continued like that for a few months until we got to the point where we understood it well enough. And then we switched gears and we started working on um, on kind of the final solution that we, that's a very unfortunate term, sorry. <laughs> uh, we started working on the solution we came up with that we thought would actually solve the problem in a, in a good way and, and uh, continued doing rapid releases through the whole thing. We, through the whole project, we, we did multiple releases a day, every single day, uh, including to production, uh, once we had a production to, to release to. So, 
that brings me up to the, the part where I talk about how we actually solve this. Maybe I should stop here and ask, are, are there any questions at this point? Fantastic. I love when there are no questions because that means that I have been crystal clear in my explanations. Right? Okay, so our solution at a very high level, what we ended up doing was, was quite simple. Uh, well, simple once you know about it. We took a lot of different databases out there because uh, we also wanted to use as much existing uh, data. And, and there are lots of really good databases of what genes there are or what drugs are available and things like that. However, they're all good, but they're all incomplete or has a lot of errors in them. So we ended up having to use um, several databases for each specific type of data we needed because we had to uh, get to a point where they complemented each other and we got better data quality than each one of them could provide on their own. Uh, the, the problem is that this field is still a lot in the... Um, it's still a research field. And if you're a researcher working on a gene database, for example, um, you can write a paper and you can put together a database and you don't really need to clean up the data that much. You can just say, okay, this database has 20% error rate. As long as you document it in the paper, it's fine. Now, I'm being a little bit facetious, but that's what it feels like when looking at some of this data. Of course, that kind of error rate doesn't really work if you're doing clinical work. So we had to clean it up. Um, we ended up with I think between 15 or 20 different databases that we uh, unified and normalized. Uh, uh, because as it turns out, um, in the field of molecular biology, even between different databases, uh, the different databases didn't really use the same terms to mean the same thing in many cases. And even when the domain terms were the same, sometimes you had cases where, um, I, a typical example that I remember, so, so a gene can come in different variants. Uh, it's something called um, alternative splicing. And sometimes different researchers disagree on wh whether something is different genes or different splicings of the same gene. And it's really a, an academic distinction. But in one case, a uh, fairly common gene called UGT1A1, we found in one place had nine different splice forms, but in the other database it was represented as nine different genes instead. And we ended up finding this kind of stuff over and over again all over the place. So we had to unify and normalize and do a lot of processing on all the data. So we had three different types of data we dealt with. We dealt with all the data the same way. So we had patient data, which is all the biological data, um, all the patient history data, all kinds of things like that. Uh, we had reference data, which is all the databases that contained uh, gene information or information about uh, drugs and things like that. And then finally, we had this thing called experience data. And, and I told you the information is out there. Well, that information in the form of research papers or clinical trial data and things like that is not exactly in a useful format to, to actually ingest in, uh, automatically into a system. So. We had that formatted and uh, kind of uh, synthesized into something that we could use, and, and that's the experience data. And what experience data really is, is a connection between a specific treatment, a specific mutation, and the expected outcome from that. So for uh, BRAF V600E, which is a very, very common mutation, uh, the drug X uh, is really good, or the drug Y, uh, provides toxic, uh, toxic interactions. And together with that, we also got the information about if it was from a clinical trial, how many people were in that clinical trial, and what kind of clinical trial was there, and, and so on. So we could, uh, because all of these experience data, we had multiple lines for each combination, and sometimes there was conflicting information. Some sources said this was really good, and some sources said this was really bad. So we had to figure out a way of actually uh, rolling all of that information up into one as well. Um, so we take all this data, uh, we put everything into a graph database, and uh, then we uh, had some biology. Uh, <laughs> I think almost all of the code is under the small heading of model biology, but uh, that's really what we were doing. And, and incidentally, this is why the approach we were doing is almost the opposite of the, uh, the, the Watson approach uh, for doing um, for understanding biology and things like that, where uh, a very statistical, very um, 
uh, I don't know, a, a very non-specific uh, version of, of understanding is, is applied to a specific field. And uh, in our case, we couldn't have done it without actually building in a lot of understanding of, of uh, biology. So, so um, we spent a lot of time doing that. And finally, so all this stuff, like the patient information we had, the, the st uh, like we got mutations from uh, our patients. That information was very raw. It was basically as close to the biological level as possible. But that didn't really make it very easy for us to compare and use it with the other databases. So we, we used a recursive process where we just enhanced the information we had with what we could deduce at that point, and then we did that over and over again until we got to a point where a lot of the data was really high level and we could compare it. And finally, we could connect it up with the treatments. Um, and this is really a, a nice, big, fat graph query where we uh, took the treatments uh, and find the relationships between treatments and biomarkers. And once we got to that point, we got a list of all the treatments. And once we had a list of treatments, we could, uh, we could do, uh, we have a very simple algorithm to, to rank the different treatments. And out of it, uh, and I, I'm not actually going to show you the user interface because the user interface is, is really boring. It's just a list of the treatments and the order in them in which they are um, applicable. So th this is really where we got to. Um, and we used a lot of different technology. Um, I think uh, I know <laughs> introduced this during this morning as uh, using a lot of languages. And, and yes, we did use a lot of languages because they were the right things to use. But uh, the primary tech stack that we used, uh, most of the code was written in Clojure. And, in, uh, and the, da uh, the graph database was Neo4j. And then we used JRuby. Well, we actually used Ruby, but we deployed it on JRuby. It turned out that uh, for the things we were doing, JRuby was between 10 and 20 times faster than regular Ruby. So uh, we felt like that was a good choice. Um, our front end was written in CoffeeScript. It actually started out being written in JavaScript, but uh, halfway through the project, we got really bored with writing all the ending curly brackets. Uh, so we used CoffeeScript as a slightly more succinct version of JavaScript. Um, we deployed using Sinatra and Composure as our front end uh, things, and everything was on Jetty um, all over the place. So I mentioned that we used the graph database, and I, I want to talk a little bit about that because it was actually one of those choices that was not, um, I haven't seen, I, I've, I've spent a lot of time before this project just looking at the different, um, how people model biology, how they deal with biology, and up until, uh, I don't think I've seen almost any, um, anyone applying graph databases uh, to the task of modeling biology at this level. And it ended up being really, really uh, useful for us to do it. And a lot of the intelligence of how our solution works actually has to do with how we structure data in the graph database. Now, we ended up having maybe 15 different node types and a lot of different types of relationships between the different nodes in order to get to a point where we had that data. Um, but the thing that made a graph database really, really convenient for us was also that we continuously evolved the database. We continuously evolved our understanding of how we should format the graphs. And Neo4j made it really easy for us to evolve this understanding. We could just add the new edges, and then later on, when we really knew that we didn't need the old edges, we could remove them. Uh, if we, we, had several, we have several cases where we have duplicate information, where we structure the data in two different ways in order to, to make it much easier to do other ki uh, different kinds of queries depending on, um, depending on what we want to do. Um, so data modeling ended up being much more convenient in this kind of format, and the queries were really fast. Um, the query language, oh yeah. Uh, so Neo4j comes with Cypher. You can also use Gremlin. Uh, those are the two main choices. Now Cypher is a nice language for the kind of queries we wanted, except it's string-based. So you put in strings and out you get a query. And we were doing all of our work in Clojure, and we really wanted a little bit more flexibility. So I got really sick of composing strings for doing queries. So instead, I wrote a small query language on top of the back end of Cypher that, um, that we used to, to really good effect, because then we could embed things like Clojure functions inside of the query uh, queries. So um, the query could actually execute 
uh, closure on the fly while it was uh, paging through the materials and things like that. It looked like it was executing it on the, uh, on the actual Neo4j server, but it, it ended up actually not being that way because we could compile it to a very convenient uh, in-between form. Um, Cypher is implemented in Scala, so we had closure code that generated Scala code. That was kind of interesting. Uh, I haven't done that before. But uh, yeah, and, and I mean, th this is a small investment. It was a few days of time to get to this point, and, and it gave us significant improvement in, in capability through the whole project. Um, we had a good infrastructure. We used uh, Amazon AWS for our infrastructure. Uh, as I mentioned before, we started out, one of the first things we did on the project, like day one, uh, day two, was to put up the infrastructure so that we could get to a point where we could deploy really quickly, immediately. Um, so the whole infrastructure was self-serve. Uh, everyone could do anything by, by just ex executing a few scripts. Uh, we used Puppet for uh, describing our environments. Uh, we used Botu and Fabric to do the provisioning of the different, uh, uh, of the different um, environments. We had uh, some custom provisioning code written in Python to deal with things like switching out elastic IPs and, and uh, working with, the, um, uh, with data volumes and things like that. Um, and then, ah, uh, yeah, okay. So yeah, and the, the whole project was basically, we had lots of different repositories. All of them had a single uh, script called Go that was kind of the, the main entry point because after that we used whatever tool was the the right tool for the language. So if it was a Ruby project, we used Rake. If it was a Clojure product, we used Lining in, and so on and so on. But we used the Go script to make it possible for uh, our continuous delivery server to actually know where to start no matter which one we had. Um, and the Go script also contained self-installation uh, using setup tools and virtual env and, and a lot of other tools to make it possible for anyone to download the code and have no, no, no installations whatsoever, and it would take anyone's dev machine up uh, from scratch using these tools. We also were planning on making it possible to run VMs locally with this, but we actually never used it. It was so much easier to just use e EC2 for all the things we were doing. Um, Wondering, am I going to talk about that later? Sorry, I, I don't know what I have on my slides. Next slide. Um, so we used Go as our continuous integration server, a continuous deployment server. We started with Jenkins. Uh, it was absolutely hellish to get continuous delivery working on Jenkins. At this point, I just I would recommend if you want to do continuous delivery, just don't bother with Jenkins. It, it's not worth it, and, and it's never going to be as good as just taking a tool that is built for it from, from the ground up. So yeah, so we switched to Go, and life was happy. Um, we had a Go master that was also fully described in Puppet and, and could be built from any dev machine. And then we had self-serve ag agents that could be completely uh, picked up from the fly whenever we needed a new agent. It was like a, a five-second thing. So we had, um, oh, the other thing about Go. Uh, so we had a lot of data processing to do. And we had a lot of different things that we needed to do in the process of building projects. So we had separate pipelines for the ingestion and, and massaging the data into the right form. And then we ran some tests on it. And then we packaged it all up. And, and we, another pipeline could use it for whatever data they wanted. That also meant that we could put together custom data sets for specific testing tasks and so on. Um, yeah, so, and then we had separate pipelines for all the various components, of course, and then a final pipeline that, that runs the provisioning and installs all the uh, components. And then we also used Go for doing self-tests of our infrastructure to make sure that everything was actually running. And so we were actually running Go pipelines against our production, uh, uh, production servers to make sure that they were still up. And, um, and of course, we had a com components on the, um, on the deployed machines as well to that, that knew how to check itself for consistency and so on. So on every deploy to a machine, we provision a new EC2 instance, we copy all the keys, attach the data volume cloned from snapshots, we install Puppet, we copy all Puppet manifests, we apply Puppet, and then we take all the RPMs that we created from, because we, we, we put all of our things, including the database, we actually put in separate RPMs. And then we install all those uh, RPMs, and then we start the servers. Um, then we run self-tests against the server. And then we associate the Elastic IP with the new box. And then we terminate the old instance. Now, notice, this is what we do on all deploys. So we actually uh, have completely immutable servers. We never upgrade or use anything else. We just throw them away, because it was messier to try to do, deal with the upgrade process than to just 
installed it all from scratch anyway. And the deployments were like less than a minute long anyway, so it wasn't really a big problem. Um, we used a lot of different monitoring tools, but primarily PyWIC. Uh, we use StatsD and Graphite. Really like it, uh, especially StatsD is so easy to build, build in support that it's just like something you should do in five minutes and then you're done and then you have that forever. Uh, Monit and, uh, and standard logging and, and status checking using Go. So the data ingestion I, I talked about, that was an interesting process because uh, we had a lot of data, millions and millions of lines of data, all of them in different formats, all of them uh, with different problems with them. So we ended up writing a lot of Ruby code for that. Uh, and we choose Ruby because for, as a data, uh, like uh, just munging perspective, it was easier to get Ruby code up and running and uh, Ruby code that could read a lot of different formats. Now, we still had a problem. How do we get the Ruby code or the, the output of the data ingestion into the database? Our first solution used the Ruby Neo4j libraries to create the database directly. That ended up being annoying because of version skew and libraries, and, and the Neo4j libraries for Ruby are not actually very fast. So the second thing we did was to create a data description language, uh, basically a, a DSL that the Ruby code emitted that was a unified description of all the data we had in the system. Um, now, that data description uh, layer, uh, or the, the data description language, uh, was then used to create the database from it. So, in real terms, our data um, didn't live in our Neo4j database. It actually lived in our data description language. And we, that was one of the reasons why we could change the Neo4j uh, configuration, the graph configuration, really quickly, because we could just change the code that uh, put it into the database and then rerun the whole thing. Um, now, what we actually ended up doing was to create a data description language that also happened to be Clojure. So uh, the actual DSL was Clojure code that knew how to put itself into Neo4j. Um, that ended up being a little bit slow uh, once we started getting millions and millions of lines of uh, code uh, because the compilation limits and stuff like that. So we used the same format, but we then have a very basic interpreter to do the data ingestion. Uh, we had a one-page app that was uh, communicating completely uh, over JSON with the backends. So the only thing we served as HTML to the front end was just the, the initial HTML piece that um, loads the JavaScript. And then everything was uh, for the front end was done in JavaScript. So we, got the we, we basically defined all the services as we were going along. Uh, but everything was accessible through JSON interfaces as well. And this made it much easier to run tests on it because we could, we could test the front end separately by testing the JavaScript, and we could test the, um, the rest of the system by, by hitting the JSON, front, uh, JSON interfaces. So that was quite nice. Mm. Yeah, so we ended up with a lot of different languages uh, in our architecture. We had our own internal DSLs. We had Ruby and, and Clojure. Uh, we had a lot of Java and a little bit of Scala. Most of it used the fact that we were running on the JVM to interact, but we had at least four or five different services that were running a separate services, separate jetties that we were standing up, communicating uh, only through, through RESTful APIs. And uh, that happened, so it happened several times during the product where we were not happy with a piece of something, and we ended up completely rewriting it a completely different way, maybe using different libraries or different languages and so on. And we stood it up again, and, and it the rest of the stuff all continue working because we were using the same interfaces. Uh, I, I think it depends on what project you're on. I think in something like this, this is an extremely complicated problem. I, um, we ended up having a lot of closure code, a very dense closure code in order to describe the biology. Uh, and the overall project, we were, remember, we were four developers working on this for a year. So we didn't really have a big team and we ended up coming fairly close to a solution, and, and a solution that is actually running in production right now for ovarian cancer. Um, and I think one of the reasons why we could do that was because we used the right languages for the right job, and, and we didn't really shy away from adopting a new language when it was the right time to do it. And um, Oh, and, and another part of the, the whole language thing. Um, the other three people on the team had never done any Ruby, had never done any closure at all. So I was the only one with experience um, in, in all the languages we were using. Uh, and through really promiscuous pairing, we ended up uh, having a team where everyone were really, really comfortable in these environments really quickly. Um, I don't think, I, I mean, 
when you have the discussion about different languages and things like that, you always get back to the question of whether your team will be able to take it. And I, I think that actually after this experience, I'm more prone than ever to say that actually this is something that most teams should be able to deal with as long as you do the other things right, as long as you as long as you focus on code quality, as long as you focus on a lot of pairing, as long as you have good mentorship in line, and as long as you have someone there that can teach some of the aspects of a language. Uh, so I, I think this is uh, key to our success in this regard. Uh, we used a few internal DSLs. I mentioned the data description DSL. We also had a small DSL for communicating with our uh, domain experts about some biology aspects. Um, but yeah, now uh, this was not something we used. Uh, we, we we used it a little bit, but we most of it was actually done like internal DSLs because we could do them in, in closure macros that ended up being very very succinct and very easy to manage at the same time. So, um, some conclusions from this experience is that actually um, small teams. Uh, win over large teams in many regards, especially when the problem is really complicated and when you have so complicated things that you have to communicate that actually the communication is going to be more of a barrier than learning. This is why we ended up seeing ourselves as domain experts and business uh, analysts, because honestly, if we had had d separate BAs that were communicating to the devs what they needed to understand in order to do it, the communication of, of all that data, all that information would most likely have taken longer and been less efficient than just us learning it ourselves directly and communicating directly with the, uh, with the client. Um, I think if we had been eight instead of four, we would not have been as uh, fast. Using the right language, I've already talked a little bit about this. Um, now, molecular biology is a fantastic field. It's very, very interesting. It's very intricate. Uh, it's a field under strong development. Uh, during, the, during 2012, we all had to read lots of research papers because there was continuously coming out new results, actually changing what we were doing or adding more information or new understanding to what we were doing. Now, research, um, research is an interesting field, especially when it comes to something complicated like molecular biology. They desperately need programming. Uh, programming is at the core of a lot of these things but there are not that many good programmers that are actually working on it. Uh, instead, the, the people who write code are usually researchers who are really good at molecular biology, and they just want to get something working. So they get something working, and then they continue on to the next thing they want to do from a research standpoint. And I'm not judging that in any way. I think that's the right way to do it. But that also means that there is a huge opportunity for good programmers to get in and work on uh, helping building really good systems. Uh, so, because that, that's where the, the, the weak side is in a lot of these fields, and especially molecular biology. So, yeah, uh, I think you should uh, take a look and maybe f uh, think about going into it. Continuous delivery, I, I don't think I could ever start a product without having CD uh, at the core of the product. It's, it's just inconceivable how you, can, how, how you can build software without continuous delivery at, at its base at this point. Um, and when it comes to cancer, this is not the final solution. Um, the final solution is going to arrive in maybe 10, 15 years when, uh, when we have a complete understanding of how uh, the genome works. Right now, we understand a very small part of it. Uh, but once we get to that point, we might be able to have a better solution to cancer. Up until that point, I think something like this, not necessarily this system, but this kind of approach is going to be the right way of tackling it and, and giving the better um, treatment options to people. And, and what I didn't mention is that a part of this, the experience data I was talking about, for bootstrap purposes, we were using research and, um, and clinical trial information. But a big part of our plans was to make it... Um, um, self-improving. So once it started giving recommendations and treatments, you could take back outcomes and start improving in that way as well. And sooner or later, you will get to a point where actually the system has learned enough to be able to, to improve just by its previous recommendations. And um, so yeah, no, so um, it's an interesting field. It, it, there is a lot of stuff that's changing. And uh, I, at this point, I'm, I'm pretty hopeful that we will get to a point where cancer stops being a real problem. Mm. Oh, and, and the genomics I talked about in the beginning, the whole uh, RNA, protein, DNA stuff, all of those things, are only they only cover about 1.5% of your genome. All the rest of it is uh, 
doing other things that we are not very certain about. Uh, so <laughs> when I say that it's going to take some time to get to the point where we understand the whole of the uh, whole, whole of genomics, um, that's because there is a lot of open space to find things in. So I think I have time for a few questions. Do you have questions? Oh, yes. oh okay, great. So how difficult, how difficult would it be to add a new cancer type? Well. The system, uh, the backend system, is completely independent of cancer types. Um, the reason why it's ovarian cancer is because uh, because we had an organization that was willing to help us um, take the uh, uh, let's see, uh, take the legal risk of putting this into <laughs> into production. Because uh, the the problem is with something like this is that uh, traditionally you have to go through in the U.S. you have to go through the FDA. And they're quite stingy about uh, all kinds of things. Uh, especially, they're stingy about stuff that uses algorithms. Um, so we have an, had an organization that helped us take the legal risk and, and act as intermediaries for the system. So th that was the only thing that made this start with ovarian cancer. Okay, so why did I choose closure instead of another language, and how did it help me? Well, um, hmm. yeah, so closure, I, I, I had a very short list of, thing, of, of languages. When I started this project, I, I knew roughly what I wanted and needed. Closure, I'm a, I'm a Lisper, so I've <laughs> naturally reached to Lisp for my most complicated problem. But I think that the thing that made Clojure the right choice was because uh, th there are a few things that Clojure gives me that no other language really could have helped me uh, outside of the JVM. Uh, actually, one of the constraints was using the JVM in order to get access to all the libraries and, and the performance and GC and all those things. But um, Lisp helped with macros. The, this system uses macros really heavily, and I think it's one of the places where um, getting the code size down to a manageable level was impossible without using macros. The other thing that Clojure does really well is the, uh, the data structures. The, um, the operations for managing data structures and, and doing all kinds of generic operations on any kind of data structure, uh, it's much more powerful than, than basically any other language in, in uh, mainstream use right now. So those two things were the main things that I really, really cared about. Uh, the fact that it ended up being a functional language didn't really, I, it, do, it doesn't bother me, bother me, but I don't think functional languages are the end all solution to the, to the software crisis either. Um, the fact that it had some very useful uh, threading constructs and concurrency constructs uh, didn't really help that much either. Uh, a lot of what we did ended up, uh, I mean, we did basic parallelization, but we didn't really use any of the fancy structures for it. Uh, we didn't really need it. Uh, it, what, what's funny about this is that a lot of these things look like they're really complicated, but if you, if you put the logic and the really hard work at the right place, uh, the end result ends up being fast. So we did a lot of the calculations at runtime, and, and we usually got back answers within half a second of time. And that was doing a lot of really interesting work to, to get to that point. Um, the last question. The last question, okay. In hindsight, what would be the one thing I would change? Well, I wish I had those three months of, of figuring out the problem back, because, of course, th that helped uh, finish the solution. But if I were starting right now, I would know how to architect the problem from the beginning. I mean, that, that's really, but that's not something I could have changed. If I go back to the beginning of 2012, I couldn't have changed that, because I needed that time to understand the problem and understanding what the sh solutions should look like. I don't think that there is any big thing that I would change. There are lots of small decisions that, I mean, you can always tweak things, and there's always, like, the second time you build a system, it, you will always make very different choices. But uh, the broad strokes of the architecture, I'm very happy with, actually. Okay, thanks for your attention.